Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for this bonus webinar, The Integral Role of Occupational Therapy in a Parkinson-Specific Rehabilitation Approach, LSVT Big. We are so glad that you've joined us and are going to join us for the next hour of what I know is going to be a really um, productive webinar filled with lots of very valuable information. My name is Laura Gousset. I'm one of the LSVT Big faculty and chief clinical officer of LSVT Big for LSVT Global. I'll be moderating our session tonight, and our main speakers are two of our expert occupational therapists in LSVT Big, and they are also LSVT Big training and certification faculty, uh, Ms. Julia Wood and Ms. Bernadette Kozer. And uh, I'm really excited. Both of them have um, years and years of experience as occupational therapists and also as LSVT Big certified clinicians. And in just a few moments, they'll dive in and tell you a little bit more about their diverse background and experiences. So just some brief disclosures. All of us have both the financial and non-financial relationships with LSVT Global as LSVT Big faculty. These include a preference for LSVT Big as a treatment technique, and also we receive lecture honorarium. Some brief information on CEUs. Um, some states do re, um, allow for self-report of CE activity for physical and occupational therapy professionals. If you are one of those and are joining us tonight, we will send you an electronic certificate one to two weeks after the webinar. Um, attendance for the full hour is required to earn the certificate. These CEUs are not pre-approved by state boards or licensing agencies, um, but can be used if your state allows self-report. Briefly, here is the plan for today's webinar. Um, Julia and Bernie will be presenting the full content of today's webinar. As much as possible, we'll leave time for some questions at the end, um, but if we run out of time, you'll always be able to email us your follow-up questions at info at lsvtglobal.com. Towards the end of the webinar, if we do have time to take a couple of questions, I'll let you know how you can submit your questions either out loud or via your control panel. You'll also notice in your control panel, there's a handouts um, section. Now you should have received your handout of the slides tonight by email, but in case you haven't checked your email or it didn't come to you, um, you can download those right now and save a copy um, for your files and for your records. The goal for this webinar tonight is going to primarily be discussing the role of occupational therapists in the delivery of LSVT Big. In a moment, we'll go through the specific learning objectives. At the end of the webinar, there'll be a survey that will automatically launch. And if you're able to, please do um, complete that webinar survey at the end. So these are the learning objectives. Um, we want you to be able to differentiate LSVT big from historic OT approaches for Parkinson's disease, outline the functional basis for LSVT big and its fit, into the AOTA's occupational therapy practice framework and define strategies for improving independence with ADL performance and reducing fall risk for people with Parkinson's disease. And lastly, we'll explore the use of LSVT big for improving fine motor control in people with Parkinson's disease. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bernie and Julia who are gonna kick off the webinar by telling you a little bit more about themselves and then really diving into the content. Thank you so much, Laura. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Wood, and I am an occupational therapist at the Dan Aaron Parkinson's Rehabilitation Center at the University of Pennsylvania's Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center. And so when I started there um, over six years ago, um, I was very fortunate that a colleague of mine, Heather Cianci, is physical therapy faculty for the LSVT Big program. So she really wanted me certified and, and um, trained immediately. And it definitely has shaped and framed how I practice. 
Um, so I see patients on an outpatient basis, and I'd say probably 90% of my caseload, maybe 95, is Parkinson's disease. And so I use the LSVT protocol often in collaboration with my PT colleagues and working in things like handwriting and ADLs and fine motor control. Um, so I find it to be a very useful tool in really taking those concepts that we all learned in school of motor learning and neuroplasticity and providing some practical real world application. Um, so I'm excited to discuss this content tonight and excited also that we're seeing more and more occupational therapists get certified in this work. When I started, you know, I'd go to a course and there would be like five OTs in the room and then 95 PTs and it's getting more and more to be almost a 50-50 split at courses. So we're going to try to keep it coming. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Bernie. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Bernie Koster, Bernadette Koster, and I've been an occupational therapist for, um, I'm gonna, just going to say between 30 and 40 years, I, I need to calculate it out completely. And in the course of my, my years, um, I spent a lot of time in the field as an occupational therapist, mostly in home health. So uh, since that time, I moved into some management roles and always had um, the LSVT big as my, um, I don't know if I want to call it a flag, but I, I began in the field. I uh, was trained and certified in 2008 uh, in LSVT Big, and then in 2011 I joined the faculty team, and since then um, have been have been involved in LSVT Global uh, in teaching activities and workshops. Um, in my full-time career as a manager, I managed LSVT Big and LSVT Loud certified clinicians. I worked for a very large home health agency, and in that in that work, I certified or I um, I, I managed over 150 LSVT big and LSVT loud certified clinicians, and we were able to really break some ground and do a lot of community outreach. This is in the state of Michigan. So in uh, more recent months, I have been an administrator at a home care agency in uh, Plymouth, Michigan. It's called Diamond Home Care. And there are lots of therapists there, and I know there's there's lots of therapists who are eager um, to move into certification, both in the home health setting and in the skilled nursing facility and outpatient settings. So um, that's my story in a nutshell. I, I am in love, totally in love with LSVT Big for uh, a lot of my OT life, and um, and we are so looking forward, Julie and I, to discussing why we love it so much and and you know what you can do going forward. Um, perhaps to become certified yourselves. So I'm just going to launch into the next slide, um, Laurel. We wanted to begin with a look back in time. I've been an OT over 30 years, as I just confessed to you, and I've treated Parkinson's patients in many settings. Home health is, is the majority, but I also have worked in acute care, long-term care, and outpatient settings. So historically, and in my personal experience, we treated our Parkinson's patients and what was usual for our chronically ill and frail patients. We would provide low intensity treatment approaches with perhaps fewer treatment sessions per week or per day. And certainly with a lot of rest breaks, you know, if you're tired, take a rest break and a lot lower intensity. So very seldom did we push our Parkinson's patients or really challenge them to work harder or reach further. So our treatment framework was compensatory care. We did not believe that there was rehabilitative potential or a possibility of improvement unless it was through modification and compensation. So we would teach our patients use of adaptive equipment, which was often futile and it was frustrating for our patients who had the significant sensory deficits that held them back. I personally remember working with a patient for several sessions to teach him use of a sock aid to don his socks. He kept getting stuck. He kept grinding his toe into the ground, and he was unable to increase the size of his movements in order to even lift his foot into the stockade. So that was that was such a challenge for him and for me. So historically, also, therapy was not referred until later into the Parkinson's disease progression. So we got these late stage referrals. And it was usually due to something catastrophic, a fall, or um, an inability to communicate and speak up for themselves, or perhaps because incontinence and hygiene and skin issues were becoming so difficult that the patient was actually being moved into a higher level of care, such as a skilled nursing facility. There was no early intervention or proactive plan once a patient was dark, diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. A patient was often medicated with Cinemet and then was sent home to cope with the disease progression on their own. 
So still looking back at earlier care of Parkinson's disease, there was a, a paucity of research. There was minimal clinical research that could support and guide therapists in evidence-based practice. So a patient with Parkinson's disease was really treated no differently in terms of visit frequency or dosage than somebody who had CHF or perhaps uh, was, was getting OT and PT for post-ortho surgery. And the approaches were kind of similar in terms of quick and dirty compensatory methods training. A therapist might use principles of NDT or stretching to guide their treatment approaches, but there was little real clinical research that would suggest higher intensity or forced use approaches, or indeed that even these guidelines, these um, research guidelines that were being loosely applied, even had any application to Parkinson's disease. There just wasn't a whole lot of research on it. So we often did a piecemeal approach. Therapists working with Parkinson's disease would try their best. We tried our best, but generally we used a piecemeal approach based on what the specific deficits were that were being presented to us and to them. So there was no overarching principles based on neurological sequelae of Parkinson's disease. Further, Parkinson's disease was not recognized as a sensory disorder, which was, would be like a mismatch of the size of their movement or their voice volume with the patient's perception of the size or volume. And finally, patients with Parkinson's were considered terminal with respect to, part, to rehab potential or a potential for improvement in functional ability, movement ability, communication skills, or an ability to return to everyday life. So there was really a very little expectation for lasting improvement. Next slide, please. So what has changed? We now recognize based on exercise and neurological disease research, that there is scientific evidence of the value of exercise in improving a person's functional ability and their ability to control the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Through a greater understanding of the principles of neuroplasticity and the brain's potential to change and improve, it's now known that the brain's function improves and a downward spiral or a progression in Parkinson's disease symptoms may be slowed and in some cases reversed using exercise. Most exciting, these are the, there are key features and principles of exercise that have been proven to drive neural, uh, to, to drive activity dependent neuroplasticity. Next slide, please. So these are the principles that we now know and what we use in LSVT big treatment to drive positive brain change using activity dependent neuroplasticity. We now know that in, intensity does matter how much you push your patients and drive their practice with activity and exercise is critical in driving neuroplasticity. We know that complexity matters. We know that as their a therapist skill is present in adding challenges and increasing complexity in exercises and functional activities that will drive brain change. Adding complexity can include in, enriching your patients or modifying your patient's environment to make it more challenging for your patient. For example, by adding resistance or by increasing uh, competing stimuli. We know that repetition matters. Our patients with Parkinson's have neurological changes that require repetitive and redundant activities in order to learn and change. We also know that salience or significance to the patients really matters. This is another opportunity for OT to demonstrate their, to demonstrate their awesome skill in assessing and understanding his or her patient and applying skill and training meaningful activities rather than rote activities or rote exercise. So we need to think about timing as well when we devise care plans to drive activity dependent neuroplasticity. High intensity activities must be delivered and practiced over a set period of time, especially early in the disease progression in order to effect change without the complications of secondary effects. And finally, specificity matters. We must target the specific deficits of Parkinson's disease and known issues with Parkinson's progression that will impact our patient's functional abilities including bradykinesia, which is slowing of movement, and hypokinesia, or start hesitation that frequently contributes to falls or a patient's freezing episodes. Next slide, please. So, so what, is, what is our work here in a nutshell? It's a single focus treatment that targets amplitude and is delivered in any intensive matter, um, in an intensive manner. So one of, the, some, one of the key variables that makes this treatment so unique is that it's not an exercise protocol, but it's equally important in that it treats the sensory motor system. 
we'll be learning what the fundamental treatment principles are, how it's very specific to Parkinson's disease and how it adheres to the principles of neuroplasticity and also how it's an evidence-based approach. Next slide, please. So we believe, we believe that LSV, TBIG and occupational therapy are a perfect fit. And we know this is true because the AOTA has led us there. Next slide, please. So direct from the AOTA, occupational therapy is the only profession that helps people across the lifespan to do the things they want and need to do through the therapeutic use of daily activities, um, occupations. This describes the goals for LSVT big through and through. When I was first certified in 2008 in Chicago, I said to the clinical instructors at that time, I said, uh, this is an OT program through and through. The emphasis on training salient functional activities in context, in real life situations, not taking a range of motion or strength component and theorizing the, the connection to function. Well, that is occupational therapy and that, that is it by definition. Next slide, please. So what happens in the course of Parkinson's disease progression, progression that can negatively impact a person's daily function? Perhaps some of you are not as familiar with how Parkinson's disease can affect maybe your, your students are earlier in your career, or you may have seen maybe one end of the, the spectrum. So one thing that can occur is tremor, and it's uh, usually unilateral. It impacts our patients' fine motor function for managing their fasteners, self-feeding, and handwriting. I can, I'm sure you can imagine the range of issues and the severity of the, the tremors can vary, and it can be impacted by several factors, including emotions. Bradykinesia which means a slowing of movement and speaking voice can impact a person's efficiency in getting dressed, their safety overall in ambulation because they're moving so slowly they can put themselves at risk. Um, independence in getting to the bathroom on time. So even a functional issue such as that, uh, which can lead to having to move to another level of care. And in general, impacting safety and independence in so many aspects of daily living. Hypokinesia or star hesitation can impact our patient's ability to initiate and stop movement. And lead to freezing, freezing, and leads to freezing episodes that can be triggered by emotional triggers, such as, uh, or the environmental triggers, such as flooring, surface changes, or even triggered by emotional responses, unless it's overridden by the use of a cognitive strategy, such as LSVT bid. Our patients do experience kinesthetic changes, um, which, or difficulty with understanding the amount of effort or strength for movement which can lead to decreased safety and balance, especially with transition movements like sit to stand. Their perceptual ability changes and apraxic movements result, which further impair our patient's ability to complete their self-care tasks and acquire new motor skills. Repetitive uh, movements or repeated movements, such as, um, for example, brushing your teeth or even handwriting, they will also be impacted by Parkinson's disease progression. If you've seen a patient's movements get smaller and smaller when they're completing buttoning, you know, they're just getting so tiny, their fingers aren't even moving anymore, or toothbrushing, they're, they're just getting smaller and smaller in their amplitude of, of brush. Or you might see their handwriting trail off into illegibility. So that is how Parkinson's disease impacts, is by limiting the ability to execute those repetitive movements during ADLs. The initiation of movement, a go signal, in our neural cir circuits and the stop of the movements, which is a no-go signal, are also affected in Parkinson's disease, causing our patients to have difficulty initiating a walk in the store, then displaying difficulty with turning a corner or stopping and turning around. Finally, our patients with Parkinson's disease often experience dyskinesias or abnormal movements of the limbs and axial muscles that can present in as uh, jerking type of movements or writhing or additional movements. These not only preclude functional activities, but are also physically exhausting. Managing dyskinesias with medications can result in a flip side functional issue where responses are slowed and dulled even further. So in short, Parkinson's disease is complex. It's highly complex in its presentation and the reasons for which ADL performance is affected are also very complex. Next slide. So how do we address these type of functional issues using LSVT big? We use a single focus, amplitude, and we teach our patients to think big. We use a singular focus in our training and teach this as a useful strategy. And consistently, we see a spread of effects in our patients to better manage their symptoms. So it's kind of simple. Next page. So let's talk about the fundamentals of the LSVT big program. 
First, our target is amplitude. This simplifies our approach with our Parkinson's patients with sensory changes so that the single focus and single target may be used in approaching learning. Second, our mode or method is different from those historical approaches that we talked about earlier. We use high effort, high intensity treatment four times a week for four weeks as our evidence-based dosage. All treatment is one-to-one -one and it's a full hour. Every day, our patients are required to practice on their own as homework and they have to complete a salient, daily, highly individual carryover task. Why this type of mode? Because our patients need that amped up approach to drive their neuroplasticity and to establish a lifelong habit. Because exercise will be needed to address these symptoms of Parkinson's disease for the rest of their lives, there is no end point. The third fundamental concept is calibration, a resetting of internal cueing. Calibration is the goal of generalization of skills into everyday life. It is working on the new normal. Due to Parkinson's disease progression, Calibration processes must address the sensory barriers where patients do not perceive that they are moving smaller or talking softer. The internal cueing limitations that need repetition and training to effectively self-cue and those neuropsychological effects of Parkinson's disease that we know of, uh, such as slowed thinking and lethargy. Our goal is to target the deficits of Parkinson's disease through use of the fundamentals of LSVT big. Next slide, please. So our goal for patients is to use their bigger movements automatically in everyday living to assure that there's no long-term carryover uh, of, so that to assure that there is long-term carryover of, of increased amplitude use. By automatically, we do mean that earlier in Parkinson's disease, use of bigger, more normal movement patterns would, will absolutely become automatic after treatment. And in later stages, use of bigger movements will become more habitual. So the degree of automaticity, it will vary um, based on the stage of disease and any other factors. So no matter what, we can expect long-term carryover or improved amplitude of movement in everyday life. Next slide, please. So here's a quick look at a single session using LSVT big, and it looks like a lot, doesn't it? So it must all fit into that one hour time period. The session begins with the preparatory maximal daily exercises, but moves into the functional components, hierarchy tasks, big walking, and carryover functional tasks pretty quickly. Next slide, please. So here's a quick compilation of, of all seven maximal daily exercises. Just want you to note the multi-directional movements that are depicted here. Um, these are also selected to focus on those Parkinson's disease specific issues that we were talking about earlier, and also some of the um, particular movement issues that we note as therapists, including backward stepping, stop and start movements, and those sustained postures that they need to maintain. Next slide, please. So let's think about the overriding purpose of exercise in an, o in an OT session. Often preparatory and it's used to move into functional activities. This is true for all of us who practice as OTs. As OTs, we frequently instruct our patients that bicep strengthening exercises are preparing you to sit to move from sit to stand at various surfaces, such as your favorite easy chair, or from a toilet frame so that you can foster independence. For LSVT big maximal daily exercises, the purpose is also preparatory and it's also linked to function. They're used to drive the motor output to override bradykinesia and hypokinesia, those, those particular deficits of Parkinson's, to produce that normal movement during the patient's ADL, such as dressing or preparing a meal. They're designed to help our patients learn how it feels to have the right amount of effort for these normal movements. This is kinesthetic awareness. And maximal daily exercises improve the gross and fine motor coordination, balance, strength, flexibility, all of that good stuff, and our patient's functional endurance to complete their everyday activities without fatigue. Next slide. Part of our skills as therapists in making, is in making our patients connect the dots or helping our patients really to connect the dots between the exercises and functional outcome. So how can we do this here? We'd like to show you this example of before and after um, LSVT big example of bed mobility. And we'll talk about the tie-in with maximal daily exercises after the video.
You're ready. Ready? Yep. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the immersion? Yeah, the immersion. When are you going to do it? In April? Yeah. You might have to go Okay. Is that pretty good? Mm hmm. <laughs> yep. All right, now go ahead and get out of bed. <laughs> Go ahead. Ready? Yep. All right. Awesome. Awesome. So you see in this example of how um, repetitive and facilitated maximal daily exercises, I know you don't know the individual exercises, but um, there are several different, different movements that I can see echoed here, uh, such as a twist and reach, a forward step for the legs and side reach. So these were all connected with some of the patient's movements to get in and out of bed big. Notice the deliberate movements in the video and how the cues for big movements to roll and to bring up his knees were internalized by the after video clip. So he was able to um, really internalize those cues and be able to move big after uh, connecting all of those dots and becoming fully calibrated. So LSPP big treatment sessions, they do build, I'm on the next slide, Laura. Um, LSPT big treatment sessions really do build on the maximal daily exercises. The second half of your session will be focusing on um, the individualized salient selection of functional goals, uh, which give you the gives your patient the opportunity to highlight you the opportunity to highly individualize your LSVT big treatment. It is definitely never cookie cutter treatment. It's always highly individualized based on your patient's presentation, their needs, and their goals, um, and how you work together on them. In order to assure this individualized approach, we use a structured interview in a format called uh, called the examination outcome measure to collaborate with the patient on their salient goals. Together with the patient, we also select four additional functional component tasks besides sit to stand. Functional component tasks we'll talk about in just a moment. Based on assessment data together with the patient, we select one to three hierarchy tasks, which are more long-term goals. As the skilled OT, we assign a different carryover task for all 30 days of the month. Sometimes it's, something, it's actually something that they walk out of the door with to further hook big movements into everyday occurrences. Next slide, please. So we as OTs, we specialize in individualized functional treatment approaches, and AOTA does echo this as well. Achieving health, well-being, and participation in life through engagement and occupation is the overreaching statement that describes the domain and process of occupational therapy in its fullest sense. Next slide, please. Now that we've reviewed some of the fundamentals of LSVT big and discussed how maximal daily exercises link to function, let's turn to the latter portion of each LSVT big treatment session, training your patients using functional components, which are short components of salient everyday activities to the patient, which hook them into using their big movements over and over again in very functional ways and in, in very personal ways. Um, hierarchy tasks or long-term salient goals that the patient has set and big walking that had, does make sense for OTs also in a, in a functional environment, and development of the carryover task that the patient walks out the door with into their everyday environment. So Julia will be taking over from here to describe these functional applications. Thanks so much, Bernie. Great job. Um, so what Bernie did such a great example, you know, it's such a great job presenting examples of was how the exercises that she described and showed really link into functional application. Because that's the goal with LSVT Big. It's not that they learned to perform a home exercise program, but that the exercises were giving link into their goals for functional capacity. So next slide. So these are some examples of functional component tasks um, that are very ADL and instrumental ADL specific. And so anytime we think of a functional component, um, these would be selected by the patient, the first of which is always sit to stand. The other four you would collaborate based on their goals for improvement, but they are simple one step kind of um, 
simple task that people do every day. So the idea is that it's something that goes out of the clinic with them that really helps be a reminder of how to use that amplitude and put those changes that you're teaching them about their movement into their daily life. So it could be something as simple as buttoning a button or pulling a zipper or pulling their pants up or down. Um, brushing their teeth, opening a bottle. Um, so these are just some examples of things that, you know, kind of have one simple task, uh, one component to it that they can do um, repeatedly five times, really working on driving that amplitude. And the idea behind it is not to make it ridiculously big, but it's enough amplitude to make their movement normal. So you really help them overcome those small movements and those slow movements that Parkinson's has caused to really change their function and drive it back to normal. So next slide. So here we're going to take an example or a video example of the sit to stand, which is always the first functional component for all of our clients. And so we'll take a look at what that looks like from the homework helper video. Okay. All right. Ready? Yes. Big reach and up. Beautiful. That was much better. Big reach and down. Good. Again, big reach, up, big reach, down. Good. Again, big reach and up. Good. Big reach and down. Big reach, up, reach, down. Excellent. So that video does a great example of showing how we repeat that the concepts of amplitude into that functional component. You notice, however, that the cueing was very simple, big reach and up, big reach and down. We haven't discussed a lot in this webinar, but cognition is really an issue and especially bradyphrenia or that slow th um, thought process and increased processing time. So we really do try to keep the cues very simple. We're always modeling and demonstrating for the patient so they can really follow our lead and not have to overthink too much what they're doing. All right, so the next slide. We're going to take a look at a hierarchy and think about how it differs. So with the functional components, those are simple component tasks. They're doing five of those, um, first of which is always sit to stand. The hierarchy, these are more complex tasks that involve uh, more multi-step components. So dressing, it might be all of upper body dressing or all of lower body dressing preparing a meal, um, writing, applying makeup, um, vacuuming. So we're thinking about things that have more components, more steps. And then we really look at doing the motor learning principles and taking a blocked practice approach. So in the beginning, it's trying to identify what part of that task is the most difficult for the individual, practicing that in a blocked practice setting, driving the amplitude to get them to move in a more normal way, and gradually across the four weeks of treatment, building more complexity into it until at the very end, they're not only able to complete the entire task, moving appropriately, using amplitude, but often using some different challenges that they might encounter in their natural world, um, like distractions or um, uneven surfaces or different things that might make the task more challenging. So we we try to make it as um, task specific to really include that task oriented training, which we know is so important. So next slide. So here we're going to take a look at um, a video of Bob again, um, doing an example of a hierarchy of donning his jacket and kind of how that looks when we do a little task analysis and break it down into different components. So to start with Bob, would you just please put your jacket on for me like you usually do? Very nice. So what you may have noticed is 
Increased time, uh, predominantly the first place we saw that is in the reach of trying to get the second arm to the jacket, and then also taking it from that point to being able to get it up over his shoulders with the collar in the right place. And that is very commonly what we see, the main sticking points that people get stuck on with that jacket. Would you say that's the sticking points that you notice too? That's, that, those are them. All right, yes, yes. So go ahead and take your jacket off for me now. And the piece there is once you get it off the shoulders, getting it all the way down off your arms, right? That's right. Where the problem comes into place. Okay. The first thing we're going to do is a strong kind of punch into the jacket with your arm and really getting that jacket up and over your shoulder with more effort this time. Okay. Okay? So what it's going to really look like is getting that, you typically put your left arm in first, yes. Yes. right? Uh -huh. So you're going to do a strong punch with that left arm into the sleeve of your jacket. Okay. Okay? If we missed. Try it one more time. Very good. Okay? okay. Very good. Continue. Now go ahead and take it off again for me. Okay. So that was better. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add on to that this time. Okay? So you're going to get that strong punch into the sleeve, get it way up there, and then with your right arm, a strong punch back into that sleeve. Okay. Okay? Go for right. it. Good. Reach strong. Reach big. Fantastic. Now a big pull up on the coat. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. Wow. <laughs> that work a little bit better? A lot better. A lot better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I want you to do it just like that again. Okay. So let's take the jacket off. And this time getting the jacket off, how do you think you might get the jacket off? I'm going to emphasize my separation here at the yep. belt level. A just big Big Push movement off. taking it off, exactly. All right, go ahead and give it a try. Yep, really pull it down. Big pull on the sleeve. Good. Big pull on that sleeve. In fact, I pulled on so hard I couldn't get to the sleeve. It was covered <laughs> up by the rest of the jacket. There you go. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Super. Okay, so we're going to go through that and do it again, okay, with the big effort pushing in. With each arm movement and with the pulling up of the coat, we're going to put it all together. Okay. All right, ready? Here we go. Big reach. Good. Big punch back. Big pull up. Good. One half, more big pull up. Half the time. Half the time. You got it. What am it. I going to use for an excuse to be late now? <laughs> It'll eliminate that excuse, <laughs> won't it? Won't yes, it? it will. Okay. But that's the amount of effort that I want you to use every time you put your arm into the jacket, okay? Yes. And I want you to try it every time, whether it's your jacket, whether it's your shirt, or anything that you're using like that. You need to have increased effort as you're pushing through, okay? Got it. Let's get it off one more time with nice big effort. <clears throat> Good. Big pull out. Big pull out. And yep. just cover it up. And Good. Good. And good. Very nice. I That's am exactly. now the master of my coach. You are. <laughs>
So big walking is also part of every LSVT big session. Um, and it really is important that, as OTs that we don't shy away from this because functional mobility really is an activity of daily living. It is part of walking to the toilet. It's part of getting from the bed to the bathroom. It's, you know, getting from the home to the car. So even though we don't address gait from a, you know, heel strike to toe off perspective as our PT colleagues do, it is important that we acknowledge that they really need to have, you know, more amplitude. They're, they're, we need to work on posture and step length and base of support for safety so that they can really do the things they want and need to do. And this is whether it's a short distance, you know, from the sink to the shower um, or from, you know, a longer distance going down a long hallway or, or walking out in the community. We have to look at varied environments, you know, that they might be in, be it uneven pavement or terrain. Um, or grassy environments, or like we have here in Philadelphia, these kind of cobble streets. So when we work on big walking, um, we really look at how does that functionally link in with what the individual wants and needs to do in their daily life, and how can we make this a salient when we address this to what they need to perform. All right, so next bit, we've got a video of looking at how we apply LSVT big to walking. This is a pre and post video. So such a huge difference. You know, if you take a look at that video on the left, um, I think the biggest thing to notice right off the bat was he was using a cane when he came in for the evaluation, um, reduced stride length, you know, shuffling almost a step two pattern. The one foot tended to take a step and the other foot just kind of stepped to it. He had some freezing in the doorway. Um, he looked really unsafe. Um, you know, the wife was kind of sticking close at points. Um, it was really something that you would be concerned about his safety and falls with that. Then if you look at the end, after the LSVT big treatment, his steps were so much bigger. Um, his base of support was bigger. Less, you know, there was no freezing through the doorway. He took off and I think did some laps maybe around the parking lot <laughs> while they were taking the video. But that's typically what we see. And if you think about that functionally, even as as far as someone's confidence and how they're able to maybe get out and go out with friends socially, um, all the way to um, a reduced fear of falling when they feel more confident about their movement. That has such a huge impact. Okay, so next slide. So what about fine motor task? Well, even those are too small in people with Parkinson's. So typically we see the movements with the hands and the fingers become really small, and this impacts their ability to button a shirt or brush their teeth, um, stir a pot, or and their handwriting gets very small and illegible. So once again, our goal is to scale them up to normal amplitude so that they can perform these tasks independently and more efficiently so they maintain that occupational performance. So next we've got an example of buttoning with our celebrity Bob again, I believe, um, taking a look at how we approach this.
Good. And I want you to just kind of uh, notice as you're watching Bob do his buttons, kind of, the, it's a very slow, small, small kind of movement that he's using to try and get those buttons through the buttonhole. Yes, we do struggle. <laughs> and this can be a very frustrating thing for a lot of people, Bob. You're not alone in that. Does the top button tend to be one of the hardest ones for you? Yes. Okay, okay. Good, you got it though. All right. Do that. So let's, let's do, do it. That. Ready? One, two, two three. three. Go again. Wow. Really push it in hard. Nice. That's about a third of the time. You're right, you're right. Good job. Now go back in and close it like you're angry with it. Really push it in strong. Yeah. Nice. How fast was that? Even quicker. Uh, even quicker. You're right. I haven't good. done a button that quick and I don't know how long. <laughs> good, good. So that's such a great example of how we take that amplitude concept, those flicks to kind of drive the movement as a preparatory um, activity, and then really working on making the movements bigger. So you could see how much more efficient that would be. And then Bob would hopefully not need help um, to, from his wife or anyone else to be buttoning his shirt. He could continue to do it on his own. So on the next slide, we take a look at um, some of the generalized changes that can occur. So this is an example of someone's handwriting pre-LSVT big on the left and post on the right. And this was not, handwriting was actually not chosen as an intervention for this individual. Um, it was really, they just did the program. And you can see that, what we call the spread of effects, where the handwriting got bigger without even focusing on it. Because once again, handwriting is movement. So you can see that, that it had this general generalized effect of doing the exercises and working on that amplitude of impacting another functional task. So on the next slide, we show how if you cue it, so the one on the left was not cued in the beginning, it was taken as a sample. This individual obviously has a lot of tremor and that's something you're not going to, to fix for sure, but you can see how on the right, even with the tremor, though it's much bigger, it's more legible. You can actually read the words. I um, mean, this gentleman's goal was to be able to write notes if people called during the day for his wife, kind of what the phone call was, take a message down. And so his wife was able to read those messages and that was really helpful for them as a couple in their communication together. All right, so next slide, we have um, a little case example here that I wanted to use. And this was a woman um, that I treated that was seven years old and she had recently been diagnosed with PD. She was really a strong individual in that she was a retired social worker. She had amazing insight into her strengths and weaknesses. She had a very supportive family. Um, she really wanted to participate in exercise because she knew that this was supposed to be very beneficial for people with Parkinson's. And she was also trying to forestall the use of medications as long as she could. Um, the challenges that she was having were re really related to her affected left side. So she was having trouble using her left hand and arm um, when she was putting on her jewelry and, and zipping zippers and putting on her clothing. She was having horrible fatigue. And that is actually the most common non-motor symptom of Parkinson's disease is really debilitating fatigue. And in the research, it doesn't suggest that it responds response to typical energy conservation training. Um, and this was participate or impacting her participation daily in being able to prepare meals and engage with her partner when he came home from work. And she was finding that she was taking her a lot longer to complete her dressing task. And she was getting very frustrated. It was impacting her clothing choices. And she was just really starting to feel kind of down about herself. So on the next slide, you'll notice, this is just that example we've kind of given over and over again of a basic treatment session. So when Linda came in, every day we did her seven maximal daily exercises. Now, of course, of 
a course across the four weeks, we start to kind of change or adapt them. We were doing a lot of hand flicks during our exercises to work on that hand dexterity, um, balance challenges, different cognitive dual tasking to make them gradually harder. So we're always driving those neuroplastic concepts of keeping it very challenging and salient. Um, her functional component task, um, she did five of these every single time I saw her and when she practiced at home. So always sit to stand. Um, she chose to work on zippers and fastening jewelry fasteners, both her earrings and necklaces, um, chopping food to help in meal preparation, and also turns in her kitchen. So when she would turn, say, from the stove to back to face a, a, a countertop, she was feeling a little bit unsteady. Um, her hierarchy task, those more complex tasks, she chose dressing, so really working on her efficiency in her um, upper body dressing, um, meal preparation, so really all of the stages of being able to clean it up and, and load the dishwasher, and then also her kitchen mobility. So moving around in the kitchen, um, sidestepping, doing a lot of things like that, because we wanted to work on her efficiency and help with that fatigue that she was having. We also did big walking every time. Um, she was someone who went out in the garden quite a bit and lived in the suburbs, and so she wanted to be able to walk in more grassy terrain, so we would set up some uneven pavement challenges. I took her over to the lawn of the hospital and worked on her walking there so we could make it as relevant for her life as possible. So you'll notice on the next slide, um, one of the uh, tests that I did was just the nine hole peg test. I think we all know this. I selected it as an outcome to look at if we we're gonna see any improvement in her functional use of her left hand. Because this quote is from her, she really wanted her left hand to work again. She was having so much trouble doing her zippers in necklace class. So on the next slide, you'll see that um, indeed her nine hole peg test, you notice that evaluation is there in the center and we can see that affected left hand um, is the 54 seconds. So twice what it took her to do things with her right hand. And even though her right hand was her dominant hand, when you think about things that need bilateral task engagement, like fastening a zip, you know, hooking a zipper or fastening jewelry, she was really struggling. Um, the norms are down there at the bottom. And so um, with her right hand, we even saw an improvement at the top. You see the post treatment, we cut it down by five seconds. Anything I believe two seconds or more is considered a significant change. But the one that blew my mind was her left hand. We cut the time in half and so close even to, to getting her to her norms. I was really impressed with this and it was more than I expected to get. Okay, so on the next slide. You'll see we also looked at the fatigue severity scale because this was such an issue for her. She wanted to be able to cook dinner without having to take rest breaks. She was just so tired all the time. And it's a seven point scale uh, with a minimum score of nine and the highest score is a possible of 63. So I really wanted to see if, because in the literature, exercise sometimes help with helps with reduction of fatigue and Parkinson's, if LSVT big would work for her. So on the next slide, you'll notice we did indeed get a reduction. So she started out at a 56 out of 63 on her fatigue and she lowered it down to a 34. It was a huge decrease. And what was really fascinating was throughout the course of the program, you know, in the beginning, the first couple of weeks, she said, I just don't know if I can do this. This is kicking my butt. You know, this, this four times a week and exercise every day. And I said, can you just give it a little bit more time? I really think this is building up your activity tolerance and getting used to it. Sure enough, within two weeks, she was using it she would do her homework because they have to do their homework their exercises every day on their own too um, in the afternoon before she would start to prep her dinner because she felt like it really gave her a boost of energy and really got her moving better before she went into the kitchen and so on the next one, I also did the patient specific functional scale. Um, I like to demonstrate when I use this as an outcome because I feel like it's free and a lot of people use it. So she was able to select um, different activities that were important to her. And she selected zipper manipulation, fastening her jewelry, meal prep, and her pace for dressing task. And I actually had her record that at home too, but I don't think I put that data in here. Um, and so on the next slide, you'll notice that indeed I was able to improve this as well. Um, so you can see her score went up on all of these. You know, she started out a four out of 10, which meant, you know, a zero is if she couldn't do it at all. A 10 would be if she had no trouble. And on all of these, she significantly raised her satisfaction and her perceived performance in these different tasks. 
All right, so you'll notice here is some research um, references that you can go to um, if you want that go through different articles on our website, review papers, uh, reference lists. So if you're wanting to look at some specific research on LSVT uh, big, you can go to our website and find that. And then on the next slide, um, we'll just summarize it and wrap it up and put a bow on it here. So I think it's safe to say that LSVT big really differs from those historical approaches that Bernie talked about because we it strongly incorporate those key principles that drive neuroplasticity and motor learning to really help the patient be successful and to help our intervention be successful. So we help increase independence and speed quality and safety with all of the daily tasks of our patients, including fine motor tasks, to help them continue their participation in what is meaningful to them. Um, we're key drivers in this. For so long, you know, occupational therapists would say to me, oh, well, that's just for physical therapists to do. When you look at how functional this program is and how much it really is about being patient-centered, and there's no way that we're not the key players in this. So this was just a snapshot overall. There's so much more to learn. We'd love it if you joined us for a course to learn more about it. Um, and I'm going to hand it with that over to Laura so she can tell you a little bit more about how to do that if you're interested. Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you, Bernie and Julia. That was really excellent. And I appreciate your time tonight. Um, this slide just shows a snapshot of how you can learn more about LSVT Big and LSVT Loud for free, which is always good. Um, it's all on our website and blog, which is listed here, and feel free to email us at any time as well. If you are an OT or a PT or an assistant or even a student in one of those professions and you're interested in getting certified, there's two ways that you can do it. You can take the online course, um, which is offered for 1.458 AOTA CEUs, self-paced, um, and you have 90 days of course access. It's equivalent to the online or to the live course in terms of certification. Or you're free to join us for an in-person LSVT Big Training Certification course. These are two-day live courses. And uh, if you'd like more information on how to web register, simply go to our website, find the giant orange button at the top that says Get LSVT Certified, and you'll see both options listed there with more details and course locations as well. Um, so for those of you that have joined us tonight, we just appreciate your time. Um, if you need to leave now, that certainly is, is just fine. Um, and we thank you for joining us. If you have colleagues that you want to share this with, this webinar will be recorded and available on demand within a couple of days. And you will be able to find it under um, webinars on our blog. Our next webinar is on deep brain stimulation and LSVT big. So also welcome to join us for that. Um, Bernie and uh, Julia, do you have five minutes that you could stay on in case we have additional questions? Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. So there are two ways that you can ask questions right now of Bernie or Julia related to this topic. One way is that you can raise your hand on your control panel, you'll see a little hand icon. If you click on that, you'll be able to um, uh, state your question out loud after we mute your mic. So make sure that your own mic is muted and we'll mute your mic on. On our end, we'll let you know that it's your turn so that you can ask your question out loud. The other way that you can ask your question is by simply typing in your question on your control panel. And as soon as you submit that, we'll see that your question um, has come in and either Julia or uh, Bernie will be happy to address that question. Um, while we're waiting for any of your questions to come in, please also note that uh, on our blog, there are many, many frequently asked questions. So uh, feel free to check out that section on our blog. There are also many of the videos that you saw tonight, such as the pre-post walking video. I believe the buttoning video is on there, as well as uh, many other videos that you can find on our blog. So we'll just give it um, one minute here. Oops. And I'm going to go back to this screen, if I can. Hit the right button here. <laughs> 
And uh, this is the, um, the slide that just shows some of the options to, to learn more uh, before you get LSVT certified. So just going to check and see if there's any questions coming in here. And Julia or Bernie, do you have any last thoughts that you'd like to add to our webinar tonight? Uh, go ahead, Bernie. No, go ahead, Julia. I'm, 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 I'm sure we're thinking alike, but go ahead. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, to point out and kind of reinforce that um, you know, I, I think that sometimes people get a little bit hung up too in, in the protocol and will people really do that and it's so many times a week and, and yes, people will do it and you really see a commitment from your clients that I don't see a lot of times from other clients. But also the thing I love about this program is how much it really helps inform and train your practice and people even when you're not doing big. That concept of how to approach, you know, motor learning and, you know, how to really apply amplitude-based concepts to training strengthens your practice overall for individuals with Parkinson's. So I think it's such a win-win because when people will do it, it's I'd see how much it helps them and how much it benefits them. But even when they won't, this continues to really always go with me and help me um, shape my intervention plans and my treatment plans. So true. It, it, it did change our practices overall. It changed my practice when I was in the field. And I, I do want to just encourage people um, to, to take a, a closer look at this. It was, it's so gratifying when you work with a patient using LSVT big. So as a therapist, sometimes it, it feels like you're just, you know, you're just digging yourself a trench or something, you know, you're just so tired or you're frustrated or it's, it can be disheartening. This is such a wonderful program to see such positive changes. I worked with late stage patients primarily, again, in the home health arena, and it was just amazing. And the comments and the gratitude from their caregivers, from their care partners, people, um, even people in the field joining in, it's just, it's so positive in so many ways that I just want to encourage everyone to take a closer look. Yes, thank you both. And, you know, one last thing I'll say for tonight, and I, I don't see any questions coming in right now, is also um, if you do choose to get certified, one of the um, really important topics I I believe is how we can all work together between the professions of physical therapy and occupational therapy using the LSVT protocol to comprehensively address the needs of our patients. And in fact, we have a webinar coming up for certified clinicians um, at the end of October on, you know, really how to do that very well. Um, and I don't know about you, Julia and Bernie, but I think it's one of probably the only treatment approaches that enables or facilitates that really close interprofessional practice. Um, mm -hmm. So just think about that as well in that, um, you know, LSVT big can be delivered by OT um, themselves. It can be delivered by PT themselves. And you'll also learn how LSVT big can be delivered in a very um, comprehensive, uh, almost shared approach by PT and OT together. So stay tuned for, for more on that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I think we're to the top of the hour. And again, I just thank you so much for joining us tonight. We hope that you enjoyed this webinar. Um, please remember to complete the short survey that should launch at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions at all, please do contact us either at info at lsvtglobal.com or you can email us at webinars at lsvtglobal.com. And thank you once again. Bernie and Julia. Thank you, Laura.